Good afternoon to you in Europe, here in Sao Paulo, Brazil. It's still morning. My name is Claudia Vissoni, and I welcome you to the session Activism and Public Policy Cross Pollination to Support Urban Agriculture. First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm a journalist, activist, and urban farmer. And I'm also a co-congresswoman in a collective mandate at Sao Paulo State Parliament. Therefore, I participate in both sides of the subject that we will discuss here today. I truly believe that public policies without the engagement of citizens remain weak. And I also believe that all the efforts of activists can't make urban agriculture evolve in a bigger scale without the support of public policies. This is happening all the time in the botanic world. It's, one, one, it's when one plant needs another to disseminate. This is the, con the concept of cross-pollination. There are four speakers in this section. Julia Giacchi, agronomist, PhD in territorial planning in, and coordinator at Urban Agriculture Research Office at Agro Paris Tech. She will guide us in a brief tour through urban agriculture in France. Nicolas Gianelloni, my neighborhood in South America, we will talk about the wonderful public policies that the city of Rosario in Argentina have developed in the past two decades. Silvia Comenero from Mexico will bring the experience of RIE, the International Network of Educational Gardens. And after the colleagues' presentations, I will talk about the scenery in Brazil and my different experiences on urban agriculture, from my home garden, garden to community gardens, from an activist initiative fighting hunger to my experience trying to inoculate the interest on urban agriculture inside the political system. Each speaker will talk from 10 to 15 minutes. If you have questions, please send them in the chat. After the presentations, I hope we'll have time to answer them. That's why I kindly ask my colleagues to respect the time limit. None of us are, nat are English native speakers. We'll have translation from Spanish. You can choose the language actually. If you are here in English, you can jump to Spanish or vice versa. And I ask you to be patient. We are with our language differences. Now I invite dear Julia to be very welcome to the ORF and make your presentation. Thank you, Claudia, for inviting me. Um, I'm very glad to participate at this debate. And I try to share my presentation. Can you see it? You can That's see great. it? Yes, yes, we can. Thank Thanks. <laughs> uh, so uh, I have organized my presentation in two parts. First, I'd like to introduce a briefly historical perspective of urban agriculture public policy evolution. And then I'll present our methodology to accompany municipalities to develop urban agriculture prog fo uh, project, focusing on a case of study. On some points, I'll go through very quick. So if you are interested, you can uh, uh, ask me and we develop more on the discussion part. So the objective of the first part is provide some crossing point in a long history of urban agriculture evolution, which is often, as Claudia said, at the crossroad between public policies and collective action. Uh, on 1896, 
when the Abbe Jules Lemir, deputy from the north, founded the French League of Land and Home in order to distribute the, to the head of household a piece of land for growing vegetable, vegetables for, to provide the family supply. In 1916, the French Ministry of Agriculture funded those actions, especially in a time of shortage during the two world wars. At the, the same time, in North America, the Victory Garden has been developed, and in Italy, the Orti di Guerra. So you can see the growing cereals in the front of Milan Cathedral. And, uh, in 1952, um, the term of allotment garden was, I think that's something doesn't work with my presentation, I'm so sorry, but I can. So maybe now it's better. Yeah. I hope, I'm sorry. <laughs> So as I, as I see in 1952, uh, the term of allotment garden entered in the French rural code and protected them by law. And uh, 20 years later, in New York City, the Green Bay Gria movement emerged, reclaiming vacant plot to creating green space accessible to all. This movement is considered as a grassroots of community garden movement that in French emerged in 1997, when the first meeting of individuals or associations that are involved already in the community garden movement, they meet each other and they discuss about their best practice and their experiences, and they decide to create a first association at national level that calls garden on all the states. And uh, in order to promote the community gardens. And after that also uh, emerge some public programs like in Paris, Green and Manvert in 2003. In during 90, I don't know what's going on. Ah, yes, during 90, uh, therefore, it's begun also to develop other projects with a more productive or commer commercial vocation to which we refer by urban agriculture. Those projects are promoted by public policy, but also civil society, and they contribute both for food supply and job creation and emerge often successive to crisis, and we know the example of island of Cuba or Detroit or the small town of Todd Morton where emerged the incredible edible movement. And at this moment in France, urban agriculture is perceived as a tool to build sustainable city. And local authorities are launching tenders or announcement looking for ideas, project operators, who can both ensure the space management by contributing to the re-territorialization of a part of the food production, but also to provide ecosystem services to city dwellers. And in France, we are witnessing an upscaling of urban agriculture in all its forms, from garden to urban agriculture. Why? Because on the one end, in 2016, uh, a French association of professional urban farmers was created to federate all individuals, association and enterprise that are working on urban agriculture. And this association allows members to discuss between each other, develop skills, and also do a lobby to local stakeholders and ministries. And on the other end, we, human agriculture appears uh, on the public agenda of different ministries, like agriculture, but also ecological transition and social cohesion. So human uh, AFOP, the association start to mapping the different uh, projects and they mapped already 1,200 initiatives 
you know, and we can uh, see that are localized more on around the metropolis like Paris, Lyon, Marseille, and so on. So French cities are increasing interest in developing urban agriculture project, but often they lack appropriate tool to promote and carry out this project. For this reason, Christine Aubry, researcher at the National Institute of Agronomy and Environment in France, uh, he creates a research office that called Expo, where I work, uh, in order to accompany uh, municipalities to develop urban agriculture project. And I coordinate this uh, office and I deal um, and I lead the topic concerning the decision support uh, for the selection of urban agriculture project. And this map show uh, some municipalities where we have collaborated with. And uh, I would like focus, take just five minutes to present the case of study of Mont Rouge that it's here located in the south of suburb of Paris. And these uh, municipalities count around 49,000 inhabitants. So the major of the municipalities contact us because they would like to develop urban agriculture at the municipal level. And in 2017, there is only one community garden and he doesn't know how to do it. So we start uh, to uh, evaluate the potential of the city in terms of space and also in terms of actors. So we start by uh, mapping all of the space available to develop urban agriculture project. And we did a technical uh, economic evaluation. So we uh, identify a potential of five hectares in the rooftop and uh, seven hectares on the ground. And uh, we uh, decide um, the, um, and the second step was to evaluate the potential in terms of actors, because we would like to understand why the municipality and the local uh, inhabitants would like, which are the demands in terms of urban agriculture. So, uh, the, um, the, the local authorities would like to develop both, create a local short supply chain and also develop urban agriculture to greener cities and, and uh, because it's really dense, densely urbanized municipality. And uh, we therefore verified these needs among local population, in particular, restaurant and inhabitants. So the restaurators uh, are interested in urban agriculture products because they consider that the urban agriculture products could be fresh, uh, novel, tasty, and so on. But they, would, they don't want to give up to the service offered by the current retailers that guarantee efficiency flexibility, volumes, and good price. So we suggest to municipality to create a working group to better understand the demand on term of urban agriculture, and also uh, consider the logistic issues of this uh, um, de could develop a uh, short chain. And on the other hand, the inhabitants are really interesting in urban agriculture, in particular, to develop community garden. So uh, we try to cross the space the, that are av available to develop urban agriculture projects and the demands. And we identify some uh, sites, we selected some pilot sites uh, to help the municipality to implement a methodology and a procedures to develop urban agriculture project. Uh, so we first uh, um, uh, suggest to the municipality to invest on creation of uh, community gardens. And we help the municipalities to identify step-by-step step the technical procedures that they could be developed to create in, uh, community garden and to uh, is, um, provide land and the first infrastructure. But also we help the, commun the municipalities to 
formalize the uh, expectation in terms of community garden uh, uh, program. Because the municipality uh, with uh, this charter uh, define and formalize the, uh, their expectation like uh, uh, agroecological system, the openness, uh, the opening of the garden to the city, and so on. And also, uh, uh, she, the municipality, uh, try to uh, also clarify the, engage the engagement of the municipality to provide land and the first infrastructure to uh, city dwellers. And now this is the map of Montrouge that uh, we can find that in four years, they are able to develop 20 different projects uh, uh, within the cities. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry for the issues. Thank you, Julia, for being a, such a passionate person for your urban agriculture. And now it's time to hear Nicolas Gianelloni, sociologist and secretary of human development and habitat of the city of Rosario, Argentina. It's all yours, the presentation, Nicolas. Hola, bueno, buen día aquí en Argentina. Todavía estamos llegando al mediodía, así que un gusto y gracias a Claudia eh, por la invitación. Eh, quisiera, les voy a compartir la presentación. Eh, para nosotros como Municipalidad de Rosario es muy importante poder contar la experiencia de agricultura urbana en la ciudad donde el, el, el Estado se ha implicado de manera muy fuerte. Rápidamente hacer un, un estudio del contexto, eh, especialmente en, desde Latinoamérica, hacer agricultura urbana es todo un desafío. Eh, nosotros en la ciudad de Rosario tenemos, y en la Argentina, un 50% de pobreza que nos ha legado la pandemia, pero que solamente aumentó, ya que veníamos con una pobreza estructural muy fuerte en la Argentina y con un problema respecto a la situación de la seguridad alimentaria y la nutrición en el mundo, y tomamos como una gran noticia de que la FAO eh, pusiera en el tapete de discusión la cuestión de los sistemas alimentarios y cómo transformar estos sistemas eh, para garantizar la seguridad alimentaria eh, en, todo el, en todo el continente y especialmente en nuestro país. Hoy tenemos dificultades en la alimentación en Latinoamérica, pero en Argentina en particular, respecto a que hay una gran parte de la población que no puede acceder a los elementos de la canasta básica. Aquellos que acceden son alimentos, los que son fáciles de acceder, son alimentos procesados, industrializados, y de muy bajo valor nutricional. Además, que en los barrios populares de Argentina tenemos una gran dificultad para acceder a los alimentos frescos y saludables, y que además sean de cercanía. Es eh, muy difícil poder acceder a alimentos frescos, teniendo en cuenta que además de que tenemos casi un 50% de pobreza, en la Argentina tenemos un 50% de inflación que en el año que concluyó. También las verduras y hortalizas, eh, para que podemos consumir y que están accesibles en los barrios, eh, están vinculadas a una forma de agricultura industrial con un uso sin control de agroquímicos y fertilizantes. Además, nos encontramos en un proceso de alta especulación en el precio de los alimentos, eh, por lo tanto, el 50% de inflación, eh, claramente que no es una inflación que tenga que ver solamente con condiciones macroeconómicas de la Argentina, sino también con una alta especulación en la cadena de producción y comercialización. Y además, con un alto nivel de concentración en los sistemas alimentarios, en aquellos que los producen, que los distribuyen y los comercializan. Eh, además, eh, tenemos de este contexto y de un diagnóstico muy duro respecto a la, garantizar el acceso a la alimentación en la Argentina, que dependemos extremadamente en la, para trabajar los suelos de insumos 
que se, esos insumos se hacen fuera del país y a un precio dolarizado, o sea, a precio dólar, eh, lo cual dificulta mucho y encarece también esa forma de producción, aún en la producción industrial. Además del impacto que tiene sobre la afectación y la degradación de los suelos, y además, obviamente, la forma de producción que tenemos eh, estándar en la Argentina tiene que ver con el uso de combustible y de agua, y también eh, tenemos una alta dependencia crediticia e inestabilidad económica. Por eso nosotros creemos que en este contexto, los que trabajamos en el desarrollo humano y social, y con esta pobreza que nos conmueve y que nos duele todos los días en la Argentina, pensamos que la estrategia tiene que ver con la generación de empleo y la generación de oportunidades de trabajo, y nosotros en la Ciudad de Rosario hace más de 30 años eh, comenzamos la estrategia de la agricultura urbana, de la agroecología, para el desarrollo local. Parece eh, algo alocado pensar que una estrategia para luchar contra la pobreza tenga que ver con, con la agroecología, y hablar de ecología pareciera algo del primer mundo, no del tercer mundo en el cual nosotros habitamos, pero a partir de ese desarrollo pudimos y de pensar que la agricultura económicamente viable, socialmente aceptable y suficientemente productiva y que conserve la base de nuestros recursos naturales y preserve la integridad de nuestro ambiente. Esto era lo que nosotros queremos como forma de producción para que poder revertir estos índices de pobreza terribles que tenemos en la Argentina. Y también tomando a Sevilla Guzmán, que es uno de los pioneros de la agroecología, que la agroecología permite elaborar propuestas de acción social colectiva que apunten hacia una agricultura socialmente más justa, económicamente viable y ecológicamente apropiada. Para esto construimos el programa de agricultura urbana eh, y es un programa que ya comenzó a andar en el año 2002, ya como un programa municipal y lo que promueve son emprendimientos familiares para cultivar verduras, hortalizas, y hierbas aromáticas y medicinales a través del método de la agroecología. Por lo tanto, un método que eh, solamente utiliza preparados naturales y no usa agroquímicos. Y estas huertas empezaron siendo para el autoconsumo familiar y comenzaron a lo comunitario, pero a partir de expandir este sistema de huertas nos permitió construir un sistema de ferias y mercados locales eh, de proximidad. A través de este programa de agricultura urbana, hoy hay más de 2.400 familias que viven y que se sustentan a través de la producción agroecológica dentro del, eh, de lo que es el ejido urbano de la ciudad de Rosario. Este trabajo se pudo hacer a través de la articulación pública, privada y con organizaciones sociales, ya que el Estado es el proveedor de las tierras, de los preparados, de los equipos técnicos que asesoran, pero las organizaciones sociales son... La que, las que convocan, ordenan, organizan y, y colaboran en la convocatoria de las personas que necesitan acceder a esta forma de producción como un medio de vida. Pero tuvimos que tomar algunas decisiones que fueron claves para que la agroecología sea parte del desarrollo estratégico de la ciudad y no solo una herramienta para salir de las crisis recurrentes que tenemos en la Argentina. Eh, nosotros tuvimos una crisis económica y política muy fuerte en el año 2001 y la Argentina, y ahí fue cuando se fortalece el programa de agricultura urbana que lo pudimos sostener en todos estos tiempos. Lo primero fue que dentro del plan estratégico metropolitano, o sea, en el plan que ordenó el, el funcionamiento urbano de nuestra zona, se integró la agroecología dentro de la planificación de la ciudad. Porque creo que no solamente uno necesita la decisión de querer producir agroecológicamente, sino también necesita las herramientas normativas que promuevan al acceso al suelo, a un suelo seguro que permita que el productor tenga tranquilidad para poder planificar su emprendimiento. También lo que pudimos hacer en el año 2016, lanzamos un proyecto que se llamó Cinturón Verde de la Ciudad, que es poder producir a gran escala el alimento agroecológico en los que era la reconversión de, de granjas que producían soja transgénica para poder reconvertirla a la producción de productos alimenticios de manera agroecológica. 
y también en ese proyecto del plan metropolitano lo que planificamos es poder ampliar la cantidad de hectáreas en la zona periurbana. Hoy la ciudad cuenta con una red de producción agroecológica con más de 75 hectáreas públicas que están puestas a disposición de los ciudadanos para este programa. El formato que tiene Rosario, que quizá distingue a otro tipo de estrategia de agricultura urbana, es que la ciudad de Rosario tiene parques huertas públicos, que son parques huertas de, de 3, 4 hectáreas en general eh, públicas, que están eh, preservadas de, por el Estado municipal, donde se las segmenta a las huertas para que cada familia tenga un lote que le permita el sustento de esa familia con la producción de ese terreno. Esas siete parques huertas están distribuidos en los seis distritos que tiene la ciudad de Rosario y eh, son huertas eh, conducidas por el Estado que se, donde se proveen las semillas producidas en un centro agroecológico de innovación donde producimos las semillas eh, que son agroecológicas y también los preparados. Esto nos permite que hoy hay más de 2.500 toneladas de verduras que se producen a través de este programa. Este año 2022, la agricultura urbana sigue creciendo en la ciudad de Rosario y a través de distintos convenios con empresas privadas que han puesto con terrenos que no usaban eh, y reconversión de basurales, eh, vamos a incorporar dos, nuevas, dos nuevos parques huertas a la ciudad. Y complementamos la propuesta que tiene que ver con no solamente pensar eh, la, al momento de la producción, sino también pensar la comercialización. Tenemos una red muy fuerte de comercialización que el año 2021 llegamos a tener más de mil eh, mercados y ferias durante todo el año distribuidos en toda la ciudad donde se venden estos productos agroecológicos que tienen una gran aceptación de la población y que además podemos incidir en, en, en lo que tiene que ver en la conformación del precio, ya que el precio de la verdura al tener eh, las ferias ser municipales y la producción ser acompañada desde el momento de poner la, la semilla en la tierra, nos permite tener un precio competitivo y que los productos agroecológicos no sean productos difíciles de acceder a los sectores populares. Creo que eso es un, muy importante de poder incidir en el precio, porque muchas veces lo orgánico o agroecológico está asociado a, una, a un consumo premium, a un consumo eh, difícil de acceder, por los sectores populares, al menos en la Argentina. Ya hoy no solamente tenemos ferias, sino tenemos un mercado, que hemos construido un mercado, un mercado central, que es el mercado del patio, se llama aquí en la ciudad, donde hay verdulerías específicas, donde durante todo el año se venden eh, verduras agroecológicas. Durante el año, también para promover y sensibilizar a la población y acompañar esta propuesta, Hacemos en el mes de septiembre la Semana de la Agricultura Urbana, donde se hacen conferencias, eh, seminarios, se realizan jornadas eh, para que también promover las huertas domiciliarias y eh, también ferias especiales donde hace, se hacen intercambio de semillas y padrinazgo de semillas. Este año, 2021, el año que concluyó, Rosario además fue eh, premiada a nivel internacional por el premio de la WRI, eh, que nos permite poder fortalecer los sistemas de parque huertas y el programa de agricultura urbana. Fuimos seleccionados entre 262 propuestas y pudimos, con este programa, recibir un financiamiento internacional muy importante. Eh, para concluir, no sé cómo estoy de tiempo, eh, es importante, creo, hace poco tuve tiempo dentro de lo que significa la, los tiempos de la gestión pública y universitaria, Claudia, ¿cómo estoy de tiempo? No te escucho. Tienes cinco minutos. Bueno, minutos. Nosotros, este programa, eh, principalmente creo que necesita, eh, necesita la decisión de tomar eh, la, la intención de cómo urbanizar la ciudad. Creo que es una forma de, de pensar de cómo urbanizar las ciudades Necesita de, de este trabajo que hace también la compañera de Francia, de poder mapear los terrenos libres que tiene la ciudad. Nosotros los parques huertas muchos eran basurales, eran sectores anexos a vías de tren que no tenían uso y los reconvertimos eh, en parques huertas. 
Creo que es muy importante el apoyo, lograr el apoyo de la población, la, la sensibilización, eso lo hemos podido lograr. Creo aparte con las nuevas generaciones, trabajar en las escuelas. Tenemos un, un programa que es complementario al de agricultura urbana, que es la huerta en casa y la huerta en la escuela, que nos permite sensibilizar y generar apoyo para no solo recibir donaciones de empresas privadas que quieran donar terrenos, sino también sensibilizar a los futuros consumidores para que quieran comprar en las ferias. Y que sepan que cada decisión al momento de consumir es una decisión política de qué tipo de ciudad queremos. Si queremos comprar verdura eh, con agroquímicos o productos agroecológicos que además redundan en inclusión social. Y en esto no puedo dejar de lado mi formación me presentaron como sociólogo, pero soy abogado, docente de sociología jurídica. De que creo que es clave dar la, también la discusión y el debate en el campo jurídico. Es muy importante las normativas, eh, que las normativas acompañen, eh, acompañen y promuevan. Yo creo que hay que promover, no solo respecto a las normativas del acceso a semillas, sino a las normativas para la comercialización, el acceso de, de tierra segura para los productores y... Eh, lo que tiene que ver con normativas que, que permitan que la ciudad tenga una estrategia establecida. Y que pasen los gobiernos, como no ha pasado aquí en Rosario, que han ido cambiando los gobiernos y ya es una decisión de Estado en la ciudad de Rosario, donde la forma de urbanizar los terrenos que no tienen uso tengan que ver con urbanizar con más verde. Y para finalizar, dejo una reflexión. Hace pocos días pude... Mirar esta película, que supongo que todos han podido leer esto, que dice Don't Look Up. No sé si han visto esta, esta película nueva. Y yo creo que pe pensaba mucho que a veces esta película controvierte todo lo, lo mal que estamos haciendo de una manera muy eh, sarcástica. Y creo que yo a veces pienso que así como esto, la, la, en la película la gente miraba el cielo, creo que nosotros tenemos que mirar la tierra y darnos cuenta que muchas de las respuestas que tenemos a lo que hacemos bien, a lo que hacemos mal, pero la respuesta para lo que podemos hacer bien tiene que ver con la Tierra. Yo diría que así como la película decía no miren para arriba, yo diría miremos para abajo. Miremos la Tierra, que es la solución a muchos de los problemas que vivimos aquí en la Argentina, que tienen que ver con la exclusión social, con la desigualdad, que tienen que ver con eh, la dificultad de que la gente pueda acceder a comer, tan básico como esto, básico como esto, que podamos comer, la solución está en la Tierra. A veces... En los barrios de la ciudad de Rosario, la tierra solamente está pensada en, en armar una, una casa, para armar un, un lugar donde vivir, pero muchas veces la respuesta está en poder poner una semilla. Creo que ahí está la discusión de fondo de poder utilizar nuestra tierra como una forma para re, revertir desigualdades. Estamos convencidos de eso aquí desde Argentina, y valero que, que aquí en esta conferencia demuestra que nos ha reunido Claudia, que hay mucho más que estamos preocupados en cómo cuidar nuestra tierra, y que bueno, en nuestro pie están, a nuestros pies están las soluciones. Un abrazo grande y por mucha más agroecología en el mundo. Muchas gracias, Nicolás. Thank you for the presentation. Shortly before the pandemic, I went to Rosario to visit the project and became a big fan of all you were doing there. My dream is to make something as wonderful as you are, you are doing in my city, Sao Paulo. And now I invite Silvia Comenero. She is member of the International Network of School Gardens, Red Internacional de Huertos Educativos, RIE, uh, which got, gathers initiatives, institutions, and organizations of several countries in Latin America. Welcome, Silvia. Thank you, Claudia. I was uh, thinking to talking in, in Spanish, but I'm going to try it in English. So maybe I'm going to read some of the slides. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. OK, are you already looking? Yeah, OK. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon for the different schedules. Um, my name is Silvia. I'm talking here uh, for a collective of many people 
we did this presentation in a collective way. So there are some slides in, in English, some slides in Spanish. I'm gonna try to, to say in English so the audience can uh, hear uh, and understand more clearly. The purpose is to talk about what are like the, the scopes and the challenges uh, we've seen in Latin America uh, around the educational or school gardens and the programs and public policies. We have um, been gathering in this network since 2009. We have already uh, realized uh, 10 congresses, encounters we call them, for the exchange of experiences and learnings and to strengthen our, our um, network, multiplying networks also in local stages in Chile, in Argentina, in Mexico. We have some publications, we have a, a, a newspaper in which we defound uh, the, the experiences of our members. And we have like this media uh, in which we share the, the, the information. In every time which we gather, we exchange the experiences. So I'm gonna talk about uh, some of the information that has been um, shared uh, by uh, several members in the different uh, spaces of encountering we have. First of all, I would like to uh, remember or share why we think educational gardens are very important. We think that they are like a clue pedagogical tools for educational innovation because they engage this critical systemic transdisciplinary intergenerational and intercultural approach and thinking. They also help us to create bonding and community with familial teachers, directors and actors outside the schools. They reconnect us with our emotions, with nature, with non-human beings, air, water, air, natural cycles and rhythms. They help us also to grasp this complexity, the psychological, social, political, economical and cultural complexity of every food systems. They contribute as also Nicola has said to the massification of agriculture and reassess this traditional peasant and indigenous agriculture as a starting points to generate fairer and healthier agri food systems. They also help to protect and recreate the free and native seeds. We are part of these movements in Latin America also. They, uh, the school gardens also help to revalue biocultural diversity, regenerate our social ecosystems and reverse climate change. And so therefore they help us to promote sustainable development. And also as also Nicola has uh, reflect in this in his talk, they promote our social responsibility as consumers of local and seasonal food produced using techniques that respect the environment, ecological, agroecological, biodynamic agriculture, regeneration agriculture, and they, they also dignify the treatment of the producer families. This is school gardens. Um, well, this is a slide in Spanish, I'm not gonna translate here. So uh, I wanna tell about several experiences that we have been uh, hearing of and gathering in our network of people that in their countries have been uh, connecting universities with governments to help programs. So this is one of the, the most important programs it's, uh, it's called the Programa uh, de Huertas en Centros Educativos, uh, School Garden Programs in Educational Centers, that was held between the Universidad de la República in Uruguay and la Facultad de Agronomía, which has uh, an agricultural uh, scope and uh, a lot of persons that are part of the agricultural movement in, in Uruguay, in Argentina, and also in Latin America that have promoted these programs. So they have like this precedent of this program of production of food and community organization also promoted by the university. And they started to promote like this uh, autogestive and community um, gardens for uh, resolution of problematics as uh, in elementary insecurity. So they, they did this, this big familiar movement and they realized in this uh, holding of agricultural and urban agricultural and familiar 
agriculture that it, there was like this need to connect also these processes with educational processes. So they created this program that was held by for 15 years. And that was an arrangement between the Faculty of Agronomy and uh, public schools in Uruguay, and also um, governments at the level of municipal municipality. That is like the, the smallest level of, of policies in, in some of the countries in Latin America. So they made like this combination of what are the, the scopes of the, the school gardens, uh, mixing this uh, sustainable development education with our ecology, taking the garden as expanded um, room. Aula is, is, is the, the, the place in which we uh, take classes. Um, they also promote this integrality of university extension, mixing what we call the um, action participatory research that it has a lot of force in, in Latin America, Yape, we, 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 uh, is, is different from some participatory investigation or research in, in other traditions because it's really bonded to popular education. So we mix this uh, connecting with other knowledge with the work of local governments they also um, promote this uh, learning to uh, the people who give the, the, the gardens to facilitators, to teachers and students of university about with um, these passenties, the, the social service, and also uh, with a really methodical systematization of the experience. So you can see in the, in this address over here, they have all the, the reports and the informs of how they were holding the, the, the program after 15 years. And so they also articulated with some other public programs. They have several ones, some ones in, in jails, some ones in former education, connecting faculties that not were only the agronomy one, they also helped to, to, to rebuild these gardens after a tornado. And so they were all, already since 2016 thinking about a national plan of agroecology. And so many of the persons that participated in the school gardens and the Faculta of Agronomia that are some members of SOCLA, that is an agroecological uh, association in, in Latin America, and it's very important they started to negotiate a, a national plan of agroecology that has also already been sent to the, um, to the parliament and that was having a really good support within a left government over here. But since there has been like a, a political movement toward right, right um, I don't know if, if I say right, like derecha, it, uh, it means like conversatory or, or neo-fascist governments like Bolsonaro and uh, what's happening in other countries. And so Uruguay was one of those and this plan of national agroecology was stopped. I know that Brazil has also been experimenting this, this, um, these processes. So uh, I'm not gonna talk a lot about this Argentina process because it's very similar to what Nicola has shared to us in Rosario. And it's a program of school gardens in Buenos Aires that has been uh, incorporating also with the umbrella of a national law of uh, environmental education and a strategy to promote the um, environmental education integrality in all over the country. So they have also uh, have this systematic process of articulation of schools, universities, um, some enterprises, ONGs, and the government, local governments within the Ministry of Education. And they have like this uh, three thematic area strategy in which they, uh, they do the formation of teachers and also uh, they uh, use the school gardens as a strategy for recycling and action for climate change and sustainable communities. So there's the, the address over there if you wanna search more about this experience. 
uh, we want to tell about the MST in Brazil, some movement of uh, they call no land. The, uh, so it's a lot of, of, of peasant uh, communities that have been um, fighting for the right of the land and they have taken the land. They uh, didn't ask for permission because there was no rights or there was no uh, agri reform in Brazil as we have in Mexico. But um, in this set assentamientos and campamentos, it's, it's like the, the place that they have taken the lands that they now own, they have uh, made more than 2000 public schools. And these schools are independent of government, but they have like this uh, uh, alliances with the Ministry of Education, but some of them are more independent and it's a public peasant school. So they are, uh, the challenge is to form men and women of the, of the peasant women, promoters of this peasant identity in a fight that promotes agroecology and food sovereignty. Mothers have a very, very important role in there. They held also the values of education for freedom of Paulo Freire, the education of the, of the peasant agroecology. And they try to, to also um, connect children with the movement of MCSD. And they also as children participate in mobilization. So this is a, a really, Claudia, yeah, okay. No, I'm just uh, saying I'm loving the MST presentation we are doing. You have five minutes. Okay, thank you. So this is this is um, this is an example of how policies are also made in territories from independent movements. And I, I hope Claudia could tell us more about MST. And so uh, in Mexico. Well, in Peru, they have like this bio, uh, bio gardens, bioeducational gardens, I think will be the translation. And so we have this uh, connection with Association Por Eso Peru, but there are a lot of associations that are working with this program. And so each association has their own personality, but Por Eso Peru works with um, indigenous peoples in, the, in Cusco and they use the biointensive method. So that uh, allows to produce a lot of food in, in uh, small spaces to feed families and have like a little extra for, for selling. So they have like this uh, integral process of, uh, of producing food with uh, mixing collective work and also uh, involving the, the parents in the committees of the gardens. In Mexico, we have like this lovely experience of a uh, diplomate uh, of formation that it's held in Chiapas. That's not a, uh, like a policy, but it's a program that connects the uh, work of an association, a university, and also a, a network, a local network that has a real peasant and indigenous personality in Los Altos de Chiapas. And there have been four generations of teachers formated in this diplomate and the creation of the Chapaneca, the Net, uh, school gardens network of Chiapas. And um, so finally, I want to make this um, connection between the, the challenges of making policies and the challenges of maintaining autonomous process of school gardens. We think that there is, is important to have like this umbrella of, of public policies. And most of them uh, in Latin America are being oriented toward agroecology. In Mexico, we have been like for three years working in the possibility of a national plan of agroecology. There has been programs that are held in this as in Argentina, as Brazil sometime, in Uruguay. So there's like this agroecological movement that is very important in, in Latin America. And that is like, the, 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 the big umbrella that is protecting and holding and supporting some of the, uh, the policies, policies that are not built from the up levels, but from the participation and multi-stakeholder collaboration of many people. And with the scope of the elemental rights and the human beings rights, and also the collective rights of indigenous peasants and Afro-Lessent peoples, the rights of nature also. 
So there's like this uh, movement, very important, fighting with different kinds of move of governments that allow or not allow these policies to grow up. But finally, the school gardens and this movement of agroecological people and indigenous and autonomous learning communities we are is held in the articulation and the alliances that with organization, networks, grassroots works, and also our ecological associations, very important, the Socla Via Campesina, these uh, free freedom networks that are also very important in Latin America. And so this uh, documentation, systematization of our own experiences, this uh, methodology we call macaque, that is a uh, peasant to peasant, um, methodology that it's a, a very horizontal way of uh, doing um, this process of learning about the practices of peasant people and also to generate better agri-food systems. And so um, this autonomous force of the movement has also taught us that maybe it's important to keep fighting for policies because that multiplicates the efforts. But this, the, this, the core and the heart of this process is also, is most of all these communities of love we generate towards the protection of life. So I hope I have respected the, the time and that my English kind of <laughs> uh, was not so bad. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Very rich presentation. Uh, I ask everyone to keep sending the questions. After my speech, we will uh, go through all of them. And well, now it's me. I will start with the context, very brief context vision on public policies towards agriculture in Brazil. We are here in a very bad political time for agroecology, as you can imagine. And uh, to summarize in one phrase, um, almost all public money is invested on big plantations uh, that provide soy, corn, and uh, beef, uh, talking about pastures, uh, to international markets. Uh, I will try to share my presentation, just a minute. Oh. Where are you? Excuse me, I'm having trouble here. Uh, it's here. Okay. Okay, just a minute. That's it, I hope you are seeing it well, okay. Um, the tributes that we Brazilian citizens pay to the government is employed mostly in credit to big properties. These properties practice a kind of agriculture very aggressive to, envir to the environment and often linked to deforestation. Our country is producing more MGO soy and less traditional foods since, such as rice, beans, and cassava year by year. Uh, food prices are high because of, because of drought and land used to produce commodities, commodities. Recently, international markets, mainly in Europe and the UK, started to impose sanctions on Brazilian commodities. I will not dive into this issue, which is alone a subject for another meeting. I will focus now on urban agriculture. There is no federal policy to support urban ag agriculture in Brazil. There is no, there's also no strong state policies. The initiatives usually are created by municipalities. And most of them, although heroic, are incomplete. But some progress is happening. Community gardens and urban agriculture social entrepreneurship started to be seen as something trendy in the past decade. This is helping to decrease the amount of politicians 
and citizens that are against urban agriculture. New laws supporting urban crop production are passing in several cities. Brazil is very big and has more than 5,000 cities. I try to keep track on what's going on, but, but it is impossible to follow everything. As I told you in the beginning, I'm a journalist, activist, and urban farmer. And I'm also a co-congresswoman in a collective mandate at Sao Paulo State Parliament. At the state level, in Sao Paulo, there is no policy for urban agriculture that is relevant and already working. So I will speak about my city, Sao Paulo. The current mayor has the implementation of 400 edible gardens among his goals. It is written in his plan, but there is no more details, milestones, or dialogue with society and activists. Until now, they just mapped the existing farms and gardens. You can see there the, the, the page, the, the page on the internet where they, they show it. But for us, guerrilla gardeners, it's, it's already considered progress. I will tell you a secret. Until recently, we were afraid that public power could one day destroy our community gardens. But now we are mapped by them. So it's a kind of uh, makes, make us feel more secure. Activism in Sao Paulo is one inflection point to start public policies. I will describe now my own personal experience and how I became a politician because of the activism. I will start in, I started to grow food in my yard 14 years ago. The main reason was my concerns for the future of humanity and the importance of preserving the ancient knowledge of domestic food production. I don't separate my activities as a gardener from my work as a journalist. I committed myself with, to the idea of spreading the word about food security and urban ecology as much as I can. Every day I learn something new. Every day I post it immediately on social media to help others to improve their skills on urban gardening. And I also learned a lot from fellow gardeners. In 2011, I created with a friend a, face group, a Facebook group called Hortelões Urbanos. It means urban gardeners. Very difficult to spell in English, so it's written in the image. The group today has more than 80,000 participants from all over Brazil. The conversation there helped thousands to start home gardens and hundreds to start community gardens, including me. In 2012, just one year after the beginning of the group, I became co-founder of the Owls Garden, Horta das Corujas. This is the first community garden in an open public square in Sao Paulo. I still volunteer there, every week for at least five hours. The experience, the experience is challenging and now also life-changing for many people, including me. Uh, the Owls Garden became famous and inspired other community gardens in Sao Paulo and many cities. Several leaders of these gardens, including me, created the Sao Paulo Community Garden Union in 2017. Because of Horta das Corujas and other, uh, and other actions as an environmental activist, I was invited in 2018 to join a collective of nine activists from different backgrounds and causes to run together a campaign for a state congressperson. We received 150,000 votes and now we are starting our mandates last year. When the pandemic broke, activities in parliament slowed down. And 
a economical and social crisis brought back hunger to Brazil. An activist that works with me started to go to peri-urban farms to donate money, collect the crop surplus, and transport it, it to people in poor neighborhoods in Sao Paulo. Most of these farmers are uh, linked to MST, the landless movement that, that Silvia was talking about. I joined the initiative. It's called Frente Alimenta, the feeding front line. And I'm there, you can, need, you can see in the corner, I'm there in a bean, uh, in a bean field of uh, MST assentamento. Uh, today, we provide weekly fresh veg vegetables for community kitchens in the poorest areas of Sao Paulo, mostly slum. Everything is free of pesticides. Some of the food comes from rural areas, uh, mainly MST, and some from urban areas. We are fostering a very local chain that fits people in need and at the same time creates wealth for poor urban farm farmers, mostly women. At the beginning, the funding came from small donations made by family and friends of the activists engaged in the, in the action and from our own pockets. Our first inst institutional funder is an NGO based here and present to this event uh, here in England, I say, Be the Earth. Be the Earth is still supports us with money and cons consultancy. In the last months, some Brazilian companies started to fund us. French Alimenta now is growing very carefully. We know that our biggest talent is the deep knowledge on the agricultural food chain and the quality of the relationship with community leaders. We know everybody, we often visit the producers and the kitchen. So we don't want to exchange quality for quantity. As a co-Congresswoman, I haven't achieved much progress yet on, yet on the issues of food security and urban agriculture. The political system in Brazil is not paying attention to everything that we are discussing here today until now, but I won't give up. In Portuguese, we have a popular say, água mole em pedra dura, tanto bate até que fura. Me and my colleagues, activists on urban agriculture, uh, I have you have something equal of the say, is uh, water dropping day by day wears the hardest rock away. And uh, we are together day by day, <laughs> dropping this water to change things. I will finish my presentation in my backyard again. Last year, I harvested this photo here is wrong. <laughs> I didn't save the last, uh, the last version of the presentation. Here I'm at uh, the Owl's Garden, but the previous one I was in my backyard. Uh, last week, I harvested lots of seedlings, crop surplus, and seeds to send to women farmers on the outskirts of Sao Paulo. They are expanding their planting area. Everything is connected. And my utopia is that all the world becomes again a big edible garden. I'm very happy to be here today and see all these spotlights from uh, all over our, our continent and also all over the world. Uh, being presented. Thank you very much for your attention. Now, we, I, I know we received lots of questions. I will read them. Let me check the time. We still have uh, 23 minutes. So uh, each one of us will answer the questions and uh, make the comments and say goodbye in five minutes. We will start, uh, now we will start with Sylvia and then Nicholas and then Julia and then me. 
let me just, I will put the, a copy in the chat, but I will read the questions um, we received and we can go on. Okay. Uh, Julia already answered in, this, in the chat about the rooftop gardens, but it will be nice to hear her again. To Nico, uh, the questions are, what size plots of land for a family? Uh, what was all that seven, uh, seven, uh, 75,000 hectares of land used for before, do you have nationalized ownership of land in Argentina? Did the municipality already own this land which has been then provided for families or it was distributed from another uh, way? Access to land is a huge barrier for uh, agricultural producers in UK and Europe, in Brazil also. Uh, Nicholas, it would be great to find out more about the three, four hectares, how the land is distributed. Everybody wants to know about the land distribution. Uh, the issues on ferti fertility uh, of the soil in, in, in Rosario, Claudia. Uh, you mentioned how there is no national policy in your country. Uh, I don't, uh, I will answer after. It, the question is if it's, it's the goal, how important I think a national policy is. Uh, to all speakers, how repli replicable do you think your model is to other countries? And if you have recommendations for resources and networks, uh, question, question in relation to the number of urban agriculture initiatives. There is a, if there is a census um, in our countries, how can we engage the ag agriculture moment in active opposition of those things that work against us and we are all trying to achieve? In the UK, there's a very strong trend for those working with food and farming, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I will put in the chat, you can read it more in more detail. And now it's Sylvia's time. Sylvia, you have five minutes. Thank you, Claudia. Um, well, I, I felt... Uh, like connected with this question about how can we engage the agroecology movement in active opposition of those things that work against what we are all trying to achieve. Um, I, I'm gonna talk about uh, the Mexico experience that it's connected to many others in, in Avia Yala, that's the way we talk about Latin America. It's a way of uh, some indigenous people named this this country we are and it's not a colonization word for that so in Aviala in Mexico uh, particularly we have been like uh, since four years now uh, having like this left government and so since then many activists and environmental activists that have been fighting for the territory defense the um, the defense of the native corn in Mexico, uh, with transgenic or, uh, or OGM uh, corn, it's prohibited. There has been since like more than 15 years, a movement that have been um, holding a, a, a legal fight. So Monsanto and other uh, companies, but particularly Monsanto that has been trying to, um, to introduce and sometimes even not, not legally uh, and contaminating corn, but Monsanto has been, uh, and now Bayer, corn crop, crop science Bayer, that it's now Monsanto, has been trying to introduce uh, OGM corn. So there has been many activists since 15 years uh, 
fighting for that not to happen and it uh, has been mm, yeah like like slowing down that process and since four years ago that we have like this uh, left government that effort became a governmental federal constitutional decree so now it's officially forbidden to uh, to introduce uh, OGM corn into Mexico. There are also other other crops that are not prohibited yet. But so there's like this movement, and many activists uh, of environmental processes are now in the government. But then we have seen that um, sometimes from the institution is not enough to uh, make these processes to be autonomous, independent. So it's so it's more important to be to to protect these efforts that are held like in, in processes like Claudia has told us, community autonomous peasant farmer people processes. And so only if that uh, movement keeps strong, then policies are maybe available. So we have been uh, seeing a, a minister, um, an activist, an environmental activist, very important in Mexico, was the, the minister of the environmental ministry uh, two years ago. And he inside uh, saw the limits of of being inside government. So there are things that can be done. There are many efforts that can be supported from government with the uh, budget, the federal budgets, the local budgets. And, but mostly are the multi-stakeholder communities and autonomous based school gardens, urban gardens, peasant gardens, and this movement of food sovereignty and free sedums that it's supporting that policies. So, my uh, my thought to that question will be like keep organizing in small collectives in big collectives in networks and in an autonomous way in order to have the strength enough to make policies um, possible and uh, and to keep with the work when the governments are not holding that policies anymore as has passed a lot in many governments in Latin America so that's that's that. Thank you, Sylvia, and thank you for this meeting because I finally met you. And now, uh, Nico, it's your time for your considerations and answers. Bueno, eh, no, primero la pregunta respecto al lote base que damos a cada familia huertera. El lote es de 500 metros cuadrados. Con esa cantidad de tierra puede vivir eh, una huerta familiar. Una familia puede vivir de, de su producción. ¿Se escucha bien? Y respecto a la posesión de la tierra, nosotros tenemos, son distintas formas. Algunos son terrenos ferroviarios, son terrenos ferroviarios eh, que, que estaban sin uso por vías muertas, que tomamos posesión de, esa, de esos terrenos en acuerdos con las empresas que gerencian los ferrocarriles en la Argentina. Otros son terrenos que estaban, están sin uso, que fueron, eran basurales, eran terrenos fiscales, o, o digamos, de, la, de los estados, tanto provincial o municipal o nacional, y le hemos logrado los acuerdos para poder darle otro uso. Y también tenemos una ordenanza municipal, o sea, una normativa municipal, que nos permite que los privados que tienen terrenos que no utilizan, eh, tienen una sanción especial por el no uso de la tierra, eh, a veces lo usan por una forma especulativa, por lo tanto tienen una sanción y se le cobra un impuesto más caro, una tasa más cara de mantenimiento. Por lo tanto les termina conveniendo cederlo al Estado por un tiempo para la producción agroecológica y de esa manera poder, eh, tenemos muchas de estas hectáreas, tienen que ver con esta presión sobre los propietarios que no le dan el uso. Eh, y creo que la otra pregunta tenía que ver con, con la forma de, de las semillas, puede ser, con la producción, Claudia. No te escucho. De, 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 la pregunta era sobre la fertilidad del suelo, la compactación del suelo, cómo ustedes eh, trabajan con esto. Sí, nosotros tenemos 
a, para todo la, el sostenimiento técnico de todos los espacios, tenemos eh, un centro agroecológico donde trabajan equipos técnicos que lidera Antonio Latuca, que fue el precursor de, del programa, eh, con todo un equipo que trabaja en el, en el mantenimiento de, de la idea de la agroecología, ¿no? que hacen los preparados y también la tierra, que habitualmente obviamente lleva una transición para la producción agroecológica limpia, porque habitualmente son terrenos que hay que trabajarlo y se va poniendo también con, la misma, con el mismo cultivo, se va preparando la tierra y a través de utilizar el compost también, que lo preparamos en el centro agroecológico, eh, y tenemos obviamente máquinas composteras que van, van haciendo la producción y vamos preparando la tierra. Obviamente que lleva un proceso y un tiempo y vamos monitoreando la calidad de nuestros cultivos a través de convenios que tenemos con distintos laboratorios universitarios. Eh, pero creo que la, la clave tiene que ver con poder trabajar eh, y darle tiempo que la tierra vaya convirtiéndose en realmente agroecológica. ¿no? Al principio comienza una transición de desintoxicación para después llegar a la agroecología. Thank you. And now it's Julia. Uh, tiene lots of okay, questions. I'm back. On <laughs> yes. Um, so um, concerning the soil, um, I think the soil is it's a very important resource that we have to preserve. Also, we have to recreate a fertility. And um, another uh, topic that we work with is the pollution of the soil, because we help also municipalities to characterize the quality of their soil and manage the pollution. Because we um, try to avoid, if it's possible, of course, to just throw away a soil that we contaminated, but we uh, promote some innovative solution to deal with the pollution if it's, po if it, if it's possible, of course. And concerning the topsoil, also we suggest to take the advantage on urban resources to create topsoil on the rooftop. And uh, I put in the chat um, an article Uh, that was published by my the director of Expo, Christine Aubry, and other colleagues, and concern experimentation of five years on AgroPolyTech on the rooftop, because they try to combine different substrate to create a topsoil that it's uh, good in terms of physical or chemical characteristics. So I think it's an interesting experiences that uh, people could share and also replicate. So concerning the um, replicability of the model, I think it's easy to replicate some solution or some ideas. And uh, the network is really important to uh, circulate ideas, project, and connection. And uh, concerning uh, uh, our structure, that it's a transfer tr structure between research and action, between research and uh, local authorities. We also uh, speak a lot with the Italian colleagues, and uh, we will see, maybe I came back to Italy to do this job, I hope so, but I don't know. <laughs> so I think it's uh, possible to replicate uh, some, some models and some project, of course. Hey, thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks also for the translation and uh, see you soon. Yes, we still have some minutes. Uh, I'm very happy. I don't know if I will cover all the questions now because there are many. I'm, I'm a bit moved. I'm, I'm very glad to hear from Silvia that OGM corn is now forbidden in Mexico. It's a dream for us in Brazil, but today it seems uh, a dream a bit far because these interests of agrobusiness and big uh, companies 
uh, that produce MG MGO, MGO are running the country actually. So we have a lot to speak. I'm very happy to be here to hear everyone. And uh, somebody asked if I think that uh, federal policy is the solution. And uh, I don't know. And I'm very, I'm not very confident on the political system. Uh, actually, I'm anarchist at heart. And being inside the political system, my heart becomes every day a bit more anarchist because we, we tend to think that governance are very powerful and we activists are small and are, are just a few crazy people, uh, small and et cetera. But uh, being there inside the, that rotten system I now think the opposite. Uh, we activists are doing so much, being so uh, little people, and we are, this movement of urban agroecology is very contagious, contagious in a good way, and it's going on on uh, all the world. So it seems that and when I see all these initiatives uh, related to kids and schools and uh, neighborhoods, we will have new people coming uh, to the planet, becoming adults in a world that going to a community garden is something that is part of their childhood. It was not part of mine. And uh, I don't know, but we, at this moment, I believe we need uh, support from the state. And this is a, a transition. And I hope we enter in a transitional to be again a civilization of farmers. And uh, when we decolonize being in South America, we can uh, feel that uh, all the indigenous people uh, they used to do that naturally, and we are trying to go back to that agroforestry, natural agroforestry, that we can grow in cities, in the rural areas, and etc. Here, I, I see every day that the peasant knowledge is not taking, dragging some attention. And I can say that freely because I was like that in the beginning, because I went to university, I'm a journalist. I used to think that two things are very easy that anyone can do, even if the person is illiterate. One is raising kids and the other one is uh, planting food. And I was wrong in the two. <laughs> And it's a very sophisticated uh, knowledge, and, but it's different from the academic knowledge. And because people that know everything about farming, uh, substance, uh, the, the, the food production in a small scale to nurture the family, they didn't have academic uh, possibilities to, to go to school, et cetera they tend to be seen or, uh, uh, they tend to be seen uh, as ignorant or dumb people and it's terrible and we feel that every day and when when i'm dressed as a farmer working in the land it's, uh, it's very common people think i'm dumb because here is the the inertia inertia uh, way of seeing things. So uh, Brazil is very recently urbanized. We still have people among us, uh, mainly, mainly old people that knows how to produce food in the tra traditional way. Our movement from, of uh, urban activists is, to, is one of the reasons of our existence is try to uh, 
uh, honor it and keep that knowledge alive for the next generations. So we are appro approaching the end. Uh, I've put my contact in the chat. I have the contact of everybody here and also the organizers, friends, uh, Francesca, Brittany. I, I thank you so much and thank my colleagues and let's, uh, let's continue to uh, build this wonderful network. Have a nice day, everyone. <laughs>